Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Advancing Understanding and Informing Prevention of Public Mass Shootings, Finding from NIJ-Funded Studies, Part 1, hosted by the National Institute of Justice. So at this time, I am going to um, turn the webinar over to Basha Lopez. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, my name is Basha Lopez, and thank you, Mary Jo, for this um, uh, for this information that you just provided. Uh, I am a social science research analyst uh, in the Office of Research Evaluation and Technology at uh, the National Institute of Justice. NIJ is uh, uh, is uh, a research and development and evaluation arm uh, of the U.S. Department of Justice and its Office of Justice Programs. And at NIJ, uh, I oversee mainly federally funded research, evaluation, and data collection projects related to firearms violence, including mass shootings. I will share this webinar, uh, during which we will hear from a team of renowned experts, followed by a discussion that will center around implications the findings have for the criminal justice system and on prevention. I am accompanied by NIJ's graduate research assistant, Danielle Crimmins. Danielle, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Danielle Crimmins. I'm currently a research assistant here at NIJ and also a, just a graduate student at Purdue University. I'll be leading the Q&A session following a discussion on implications the findings have on the criminal justice system and prevention. Thanks. Thank you. Before we give the floor to our guests, I would like to uh, mention that since the 1980s, our institute uh, has sponsored research in an effort to assist our nation in reducing firearms violence by supporting rigorous studies and evaluation of programs to build knowledge and advance evidence-based practices aimed at reduction of firearms violence. Building on various previous projects carried out by NIJ, including several projects funded under our Comprehensive School Safety Initiative, since 2018, NIJ prioritized research on mass public shootings under the firearms violence portfolio and solicited for research projects on this topic through its investigator-initiated research and evaluation on firearms violence competitive solicitation. So what you will hear today are the, is some of the preliminary results or the results already published uh, by uh, one of this uh, NIJ-funded project. Uh, the research team who, uh, uh, this research team received an award in 2018 for the project uh, titled The Nature Trends, Correlates, and Prevention of Mass Public Shootings in America, 1976-2018. Uh, Our panel consists of um, uh, research uh, experts in studying gun violence and mass killing, specifically mass shootings. Uh, our first presenter, James Allen Fox, is the Lipman Family Professor of Criminology, Law, and Public Policy at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Our second presenter is Grant Dewey. Dr. Grant Dewey is the Director of Research and Evaluation for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. And our final presenter is Dr. Michael Rock. He is an Associate Professor of Sociology at Bates College, Livingston, Maine. So, with no further ado, uh, we will start with Dr. Fox and his presentation on trend, tr trends and contagion in mass public shootings. Uh, thank you, and thank you for NIJ, not just for the funding, but for this opportunity to speak today, to present some of our findings. We have one more year on the project, and we have several other items in our in, that are in the works. I also want to thank you for giving me the first opportunity in nine months to wear a coat and tie, given the fact that I've been home so so much uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, anyway, let's get started. So um, it's nice to see a very large number of, of people here today. I know it's not because of uh, uh, us as presenters, it's more the topic, but that's it's interesting because I started studying mass shootings 
and mass killings 40 years ago, and Grant Dewey about 30 years ago. And back then, no one was interested in mass killing, mass shooting. Uh, among criminologists, certainly, certainly serial murder, but not mass killing. Uh, but then came 2012. All things changed back then. We had, you know, bad things happened in threes, they say, and we certainly had three horrible things that year. We had the Quakers uh, University shooting, uh, the shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, in Aurora, Colorado, and of course, the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Connecticut. Uh, things were so bad that year in terms of mass shootings that the Associated Press uh, named mass shootings the top story of the year, beat out uh, uh, the other Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, and also beat out the presidential election of the year. Well, all, the interest also was high among academics starting in 2012. Prior to 2012, relatively little was published in the area of mass shootings, but since then there's been exponential growth in publications in the area of, of uh, mass shootings by scholars. Um, now, unfortunately, there was no official database. Sure, there was the supplementary homicide reports, and you could look at, at shootings of four more people, but the, the data were terribly flawed. A lot of cases were in there that shouldn't be. Cases, for example, where one person was killed and three people were injured, and they were all listed as if they were homicide victims, and many cases that should have been in there that weren't. So starting in 2012, 2013, a variety of academic organizations and news organizations started to create and launch these uh, database projects. Uh, there were about a dozen, and I've listed some of them here. And they vary, as you can see, in terms of time frame, in terms of the number of, uh, of, of victims required for the threshold, and whether those victims had to be killed or just injured. So here are just uh, three in particular. And as you can see, they vary, these vary in terms of, of, of there are four more victims as the threshold, which is the, the standard threshold that had been used for many, many years. And uh, as you can see, they vary in terms of whether the victims were, uh, were, had to be uh, shot or just or killed. Uh, now you have, for example, the gun violence archive. I'll talk about that later. And where we had a, an average of just over one person killed, one victim killed per case. The others, of course, were shot and injured. Uh, and we have, for example, the uh, USA Today, uh, the Northeastern sorry, Associated Press, USA Today, Northeastern University database. It goes back to 2006, and they include all mass killings of four or more people. Uh, on average, 5.7 victims killed. And then we have public mass killings, and the FDR there stands for Fox Dewey Roke. That's three of us. Uh, we're focusing just on cases that are in public places, we're eliminating family massacres, we're eliminating uh, uh, gang-related, drug-related, uh, robbery-related cases. These are the more indiscriminate cases uh, in public places. Uh, they are what frightens America. Uh, the, it's not the ones that are more common, it's the ones that are more deadly that frighten Americans. It's also when people think about mass shootings, they associate it with these large-scale massacres like we, we had, for example, in El Paso and uh, Dayton last year. So mass public shootings, as we define it again, four more killed in public place, they're not the majority of cases. In fact, uh, about half of mass killings are family annihilations. Uh, and then we have, of course, the felony-related cases that I mentioned. Uh, most people don't worry about those. It's not their family. Uh, they're not in a situation to be involved in a gang-related uh, uh, shooting. What people worry about is a matter of the public cases, because it can happen at any time, at any place, to anyone. Uh, so we, we focused on those. The other reason we focused on those, of course, was that the NIJ solicitation specifically indicated interest in mass public shootings. Uh, so looking at the trends over the past 40 years, uh, and the right you have the rate per million, uh, there was some increase in starting in the mid-2000s no uh, uh, until the middle of this decade, but clearly there's been a spike in 2018 and 2019, um, which of course got a lot of attention in the press. In terms of the severity, one of the uh, significant changes in the recent years 
is the average size of these killings in terms of victim fatalities. Prior to 2015, the average number of victims killed per case was six, and since then, uh, 12. Of course, part of that is the fact that uh, four of the eight cases in which 20 or more people were killed, they're listed here, occurred since 2015. So these stories and these cases have led many Americans to believe it's an epidemic, if you can see in its quotes here. Uh, I'm not so sure it's an epidemic. Uh, clearly, one would want to have a better definition of epidemic, uh, but I kind of question that when you think about the fact that we're talking about a crime in terms of mass public shooting that represents, uh, in terms of victim count, less, significantly less than 1% of all people killed each year in the United States. Of course, they do these cases, although they're the, not very common, do stoke, uh, stoke public fears. And in terms of fear, these surveys clearly indicate that. Uh, ABC News showing that uh, six out of 10 Americans fear that there'll be a mass shooting in their community. And uh, a USA Today poll, also in 2019, showed that about one in five Americans avoid certain public places for fear that they'll be the victim of a mass killing. And as you can see uh, by the uh, Chapman University uh, Fear Index, the level of fear associated with mass shooting certainly has grown over the past few years. So why is this disconnect between the risk and fear? Fear is high, 60% fear mass shootings, yet we're talking about a rare event uh, that occurs uh, in terms of mass public shootings and are average about six times a year, deadly though they may be. Well, to some extent, there's misunderstanding and confusion about the data sets and how they define mass killings. And then part of it is also the nature of the, of the media coverage. For example, uh, the Gun Violence Archive, uh, starting in 2013, basically said, well, maybe a mass shooting doesn't have to have people get killed, maybe just shot. So they started collecting data on the number of cases of four more killed. I'm so, sorry, four more shot. And it's valuable data to be sure. But it's not the same as a mass killing. And unfortunately, people get confused. For example, the CBS News uh, image here, uh, there's been uh, more than one mass shooting uh, a day in the United States. But if you look at the list there, they're all mass killings with large victim counts. So no wonder the American public gets confused. So they're not, they're certainly, they're certainly important, but some injuries are minor, whereas death is definitive. So we tend to focus on cases in which four or more people get killed. Um, also, in terms of the gun violence archive, when people hear one, more than one a day and think about an epidemic, well, no one can say how many there were in 2010 or 2005. We don't have data that go back before 2013 in terms of these kinds of mass shootings. We do in terms of mass killings. Uh, the other factor in terms of public perception, of course, is the nature of the media. If you go back... You know, when Sandy Hook happened, people were, were astonished and shocked that an elementary school could be the site of a mass shooting. Well, it wasn't the first. Back in 1989, there was a, a mass shooting at an elementary school in Stockton, California. Very few people remember it, uh, probably because it wasn't on television. Back in 1989, we only had the major network. C, uh, N, uh, CNN was, was just really in its infancy. We didn't have MS, MSNBC or Fox News back then. But things of today are different. We have cable news channels that cover these cases around the clock, marathon coverage, and we have satellite trucks that now can be on the scene within minutes carrying these images of children being led away from their school with tears still fresh in their eyes. Seeing is believing, and Americans, by seeing these things, believe it's rampant and an epidemic. So we started looked at uh, what gets covered the most. Uh, back in 2000, Grant Dewey published an article showing that mass public mass shootings get far more coverage than family and felony cases, not surprisingly. So one of the projects would look at what, what aspects about mass public shootings uh, attract the news media. And not surprisingly, it's those with the higher death tolls, uh, younger offenders, particularly in schools and churches, uh, cases that involve terrorism, cases that involve predominantly white victims, and an assailant who's arrested so that you can have continuing media coverage. Um, this paper, by the way, was, will be coming out shortly in Homicide Studies. Uh, 
Now, the mass and media attention raises the issue about contagion. Uh, is there a price to this news coverage? Uh, to the extent is there copycatting? Of course, there are some iconic uh, mass killers that get receive a lot of attention. Most of them don't. And this issue of contagion certainly was got a tremendous amount of credence by a uh, widely cited paper by uh, Sherry Towers and colleagues at the University uh, at Arizona State University that basically showed that mass killings uh, tend to raise the probability of another event for about 13 days. It incites or excites uh, further killings. Uh, now, clearly, that seems to indicate a contagion effect. But the thing is, they looked at USA Today data on mass shootings. Most of those cases are family cases, are felony cases, and they receive very little media attention, if at all. Uh, and unfortunately, although it's a terrific study, uh, it did not include any measure of how much media coverage was given to these mass shootings. So what we wanted to do is to uh, sort of re repeat that approach, but look at uh, the coverage that these cases receive and how does that tend to create contagion, if at all. So if you look at what we collected data on the number of, um, sorry, the amount of media coverage, um, uh, daily media coverage from the year 2000 to 2018, how much media coverage about mass shootings in major newspapers, 13 major newspapers weighted by their their uh, uh, circulations, uh, also the Associated Press, uh, why, uh, Associated Press, and finally uh, television news programs. And as you can see, there's been increase in terms of the number and the s severity of of mass shootings over the years. And paralleling that has been in the gray an increase in the amount of media coverage. So. They both have increased. The question is, how can we disentangle the cause and effect here? So this shows you the amount of media coverage in terms of major papers leading up to a mass a public mass shooting and then afterwards. And clearly, this, the mass shootings uh, create tremendous amount of pu publicity, but there doesn't seem to be any run up in publicity prior to the shootings. So at least there's no short term uh, contagion effect based on media coverage. And the same thing ten, we tend to see in terms of the Associated Press and television networks. The lag uh, in terms of the peaks are somewhat different based on the uh, uh, practicalities about how soon can the news be, be reported based on television or daily newspapers. Um, in addition to this uh, graphical approach, we, in, we also did uh, look at a multivariate point process model, very similar to what Towers et al. did, but we included the amount of media coverage as a variable. And essentially what we found was that uh, media coverage did not tend to excite further mass shootings. And in fact, mass shootings didn't excite further mass shootings, at least in the short term. Uh, but certainly mass shootings did tend to create a tremendous amount of media coverage as shown in these figures here. Now, the, uh, prior, previously, I, I, I didn't mention it, uh, I noted the no notoriety pledge that, that about over 150 criminologists signed on to, to a letter urging the, the media not to show the face of killers, not to mention their names. Well-meaning, certainly that it is, and I understand that in, the, uh, in terms of the victims, at least, the victims' families, it uh, adds insult to injury when these offenders get tremendous amount of publicity. But in terms of contagion and copycatting, what really influences uh, other people and like-minded individuals, it's not the actor, it's the act. So, for example, when when uh, uh, there's a massacre in at El Paso of his, Hispanics, other white supremacists applauded, but they don't necessarily applaud the person, the name. They don't, they don't, many of them don't even know the name of the perpetrator. What they applaud is what that person did. So it doesn't matter what the guy's name is and what the face is, it's what he did. And certainly the media is not going to stop reporting the crime. Um, 
they should indeed report the facts. And part of the factual inf information about a case is who did it, uh, where they got the gun, uh, certain information about their background, basic information. Unfortunately, sometimes they do go a little bit over the board in terms of humanizing that killer by presenting information that's really not necessary for our understanding of the crime. For example, uh, uh, the Virginia Tech shooter shown on the New York Times, all the news that fit the print, they guess they thought it was, thought it was fitting to show him with guns uh, pointed out. Now, that's quite different than just a simple headshot. Or, for example, with the Las Vegas killer, uh, we learned so much about that person, what he ate for dinner on the night of the shooting, what shoe size he had uh, wore, uh, what casino games he liked. We even had pictures of him on his high school tennis team, as if that really is important. We knew more about him than our next door neighbors, and that's kind of a problem. Um, so a certain line is often crossed when they turn someone from uh, an offender to almost a celebrity. Um, also, I should say that the, the media should stop uh, publishing it in full length their, their rants and stop calling them manifestos, which they really aren't, because that implies a far greater importance than, than is deserved. Finally, they should focus on strength and resilience. For example, in El Paso, after the shooting, the members of the community lining up to give blood. That's a story that people should be hearing, not stories about, about tennis teams, pictures of a, of a shooter. Uh, in terms of contagion, not all contagion is media related. In fact, maybe contagion all has to do with the public obsession, constant discussion. So, for example, this is a, a similar uh, situation. These are school shootings, not necessarily mass shootings. But back in the late 1990s, uh, there were eight separate uh, multiple victim shootings in schools. It was a tremendous amount of attention in America on the news. The Department of Education sent pamphlets to every school in America about, about the warning signs. Uh, President Bill Clinton established a, a uh, advisory committee on school shootings. And then in, in, uh, in uh, March of 2001, after a shooting in Santee, California, Dan Rather declared mass shooting of uh, school shootings a national epidemic. But then there wasn't another one for four years. The reason, probably, was the fact that we had 9-11, the attack on America. All of a sudden, people weren't talking about school shootings. They were talking about a different kind of threat, threat from abroad, international terrorism, al-Qaeda. And after, once people's attentions were diverted, it just didn't continually reinforce this no idea that schools are dangerous places and kids bring guns to school to get even with their classmates. And so for four years, there wasn't another one. Now, can that happen now? Maybe. Uh, in 2000, in this year, 2020, we have had only two public mass shootings. Of course, public places have been closed, churches closed, uh, no concerts, uh, restaurants are closed. So that has contributed to the fact that there hasn't been in, uh, very many public mass shootings because there aren't places for people can, to convene. Now, I'm hoping that this external threat, the pandemic, will be a distraction, very much like 9-11 was a distraction for school shootings. And then hopefully, time will tell, the panic and the social contagion, the constant talking and worrying and obsession about mass shootings will not reemerge uh, once we get back to a normal uh, lifestyle. So I've talked about trends uh, in the past, and so now I'm going to hand things over to Grant Dewey, who's going to talk about what the future holds in terms of mass public shootings. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to hearing any questions, and hopefully I didn't speak too quickly. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so a lot of the, the research that has been done on mass murder or mass shootings has really focused on trying to describe the, the people who, who commit these acts, uh, those who get victimized, the incident characteristics, but there really hasn't been a whole lot of attention that, that's been focused on 
um, trying to uh, trying to control and predict the, these types of events. And um, and so for my presentation today, I'll be talking about a study uh, that I did with my co-panelists and Nathan Sanders that attempts to forecast the severity of mass public shootings uh, in the future. And as, I, as I'll show in more detail later on, uh, both the incidence and severity of mass public shootings have increased uh, since the, the latter part of the 2000s. Uh, two, of the, two of the worst attacks um, or two of the worst attacks during this recent uh, increase, as we all know, were the massacres that took place in Orlando in Las Vegas. A little more than 100 victims were shot uh, in Orlando, 49 fatally, while nearly 500 victims were shot in Las Vegas with 60 people who ended up being mortally wounded. And in this study, we, we, consider, uh, we consider a couple of questions. One is, what is the likelihood uh, of attacks as catastrophic as Orlando or Las Vegas occurring in the next five years or 10 years or 20 years? And, and, and perhaps what's just as interesting, if not more so, is what is the probability of an even worse mass public shooting taking place in the future? And so for this presentation, um, I will show results that, that we've been able to, to gather from a study uh, that, that we've been working on that's currently under review. And to address these questions, we, we draw on research from other fields that, that have developed uh, valid estimates of the future likelihood of rare catastrophic events. For example, seismologists have use procedures to predict the, the likelihood of severe earthquakes or earthquakes that exceed 7.0 on the Richter scale. Or in a more recent example, researchers have estimated the odds the U.S. would experience a terrorist event as catastrophic as 9-11 at some point in the future. And this research has shown that these phenomena tend to follow uh, heavy tail distributions such as power laws, which, which is to say that most events are, are relatively uh, small in terms, of, in terms of severity, while a small number of events are, are very severe. And we know that mass public shootings, even, even though it, by definition, it is a very severe type of event, um, these phenomena also tend to follow heavy tail distributions. Um, and, and, and so what we see is that most mass public shootings that take place uh, involve four or five or six uh, fatal victims, while relatively few uh, fortunately involve more than 10. Or most mass public shootings we see um, in, involve, uh, or at least the, the total number of victims shot is less than, than 25. Um, and so given that mass public shootings follow this heavy tail distribution, it makes it possible for us to, to forecast the severity of these types of events in the future. So one of, one of the questions that, that, that may arise is, why is it important for us to, to try to forecast the severity of mass public shootings? What in, so in other words, why does it matter? And I think the reason why it's important is is that the, the forecast estimates that we, de, that we develop, no matter what they turn out to be, can have implications for how, how we go about allocating resources uh, in the future. Um, if the likelihood is very low, for example, uh, then it might call into question any policies or practices uh, that we would have that would specifically focus on preventing or responding to catastrophic attacks. But if, on the other hand, uh, the estimates that we develop show the likelihood is, is, rel is higher, is greater than say 10%, or if it's 20% or 30%, then it might be more relevant 
uh, for us to, to do things like modeling the trauma capacity of regional hospital systems, uh, developing an understanding of the potential consequences of prevention or mitigation strategies. Uh, strategies and policies, or even something like assessing risk around large public gatherings. So before I begin to talk a bit more about the methodology we used and, and the results, I think it's important to take a few slides to uh, explain how we defined uh, mass public shooting specifically and how we went about uh, measuring these events. And I think it's you know, given some of the confusion that's arisen over the phrase mass shootings and and the the number of definitions that that have come about, I th um, in fact, uh, one one of my co-panelists, Jamie Fox, has, has said that there's been mass confusion that's risen over use of the phrase uh, mass shootings, and and I would agree, and and so I think it's important to to try to clarify what we mean by that, and so with the mass murder, we're talking about any incident in which four or more people are killed within a 24-hour period. A mass shooting, um, although it's taken on a number of different definitions, could could mean just any gun-related mass murder. And so with a mass public shooting, we're looking at those incidents in which four or more victims are killed with a gun in a public location. And so in doing so, we're excluding cases that occurred in connection with other criminal activity. And, and the mass public shootings, that these be, partly because they involve more victims who who were killed and who are wounded, they tend to be more newsworthy um, because they take place in a public location. Um, that also increases their their newsworthiness. And and you know, as you'll see, that here's some infamous examples of mass public shootings like Columbine, Virginia Tech, or Las Vegas. And Jamie noted that they make up about 20 to 25 percent of all mass shootings. But when we consider um, mass murders more, more broadly, a, a mass killing committed with any type of weapon, we see that they make up about, about 12 percent. So mass public shootings are a relatively infrequent type of event, even within the context of mass murder, which is itself a, an infrequent but extreme uh, type of violence. So in measuring mass public shootings, um, we, we used what are considered best practices in terms of data collection. We used a triangulated data collection strategy where we initially relied on the, F the FBI's supplementary homicide reports from 1976 to 2018. And um, even though the, the, the SHR has a number of flaws, it is a relatively comprehensive uh, data source on all homicides that take place in the U.S. It, it enabled us to, at least to initially identify when and where uh, ma mass killings have occurred, um, but there, it does not contain information on the number of wounded victims or the specific type of location, and that's why it's important to, uh, to gather more detailed information that come from uh, news coverage. And so using those two data sources together enabled us to uh, comprehensively identify mass public shootings that, that took place uh, over that 43-year period. And this is a strategy, by the way, that has been used not only by the Congressional Research Service in their, in their own report that they disseminated in 2015, but also by USA Today. Um, in addition to this strategy, we consulted uh, both published and unpublished uh, list of mass public shootings. And then we also did a consensus review, uh, FDR. Uh, essentially what we did is we, we looked at all the cases that potentially met our criteria for inclusion, and then uh, we, we came to an agreement as to which cases to include and which ones not. And we ended up with an overall sample of 156 cases from 1976 to 2018. And, and so what that, that works out to a little less than, than four mass public shootings per year uh, over that period, a uh, total of uh, 2,360 victims who were shot, of whom 1,092 were killed. And so when we look at trends um, in, 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 in the incidents of mass public shootings over that 43-year period, um, and if we express it in terms of a, a rate 
per 100 million uh, of the U.S. population over that period, we do see that, that there has been an, an increase uh, since the, the latter uh, two 2000s. And the, the black line that you see represents a five-year moving average. And so when you look at that, that black line, the, the five-year moving average, we do see that there is, that there is an uptick in, in the latter part of the 2000s, really, I would say, after, uh, a, after Virginia Tech. And then, uh, as Jamie noted in, in his presentation, there, there has been um, a spike in the last several years, um, especially from uh, 2017 onwards. And this is reflected in, uh, in one of the two severity measures that, that we consider. Um, one is the, the number of victims who were killed in mass public shootings. And, and once again, we, we see an increase uh, from the latter part of the 2000s up to the present and especially over the last couple of years, where, where there has been a, a decided uh, spike in the severity of mass public shootings. And then the, the other um, severity outcome measure that, that, that uh, we'll consider is the total number of victims shot in mass public shootings. And, and once again, this is a rate uh, per 100 million uh, that it controls for population increases over time. And in this slide, um, in order to, to make it, um, in order to more clearly depict the trends that we see, this excludes the Las Vegas case. Um, so even if we exclude Las Vegas from 2017, um, we still see a, a large increase in the severity of cases uh, over roughly about the last 15 years. So when, when we're generating a forecast of the severity of mass public shootings, um, one of the key assumptions that we make is that the likelihood of a catastrophic attack is influenced by the future incidents of mass public shootings. Um, in, in their paper that I, I referenced earlier on estimating the recurrence of something like 9-11, uh, Closet and Woodard, uh, use three sets of assumptions in, in gauging how, in, in, in estimating how frequent uh, terrorist events would be. And, and so one of their assumptions was a, a pessimistic assumption where it's assumed that the incidence of terrorism would be really high. Um, in addition, they, they had a status quo assumption, which assumed that everything would, would kind of stay uh, stay normal or, or average based on what, what's been observed in the past. And then they had an optimistic scenario, which assumed that the incidence of terrorism would be relatively low. And we, we followed that same approach here, where we, we had three sets of assumptions about the future incidence of mass public shootings um, over the next 20 years. And so for, and we, we grounded these estimates in the historical data that we have from 1976 to 2018. And so for our, our pessimistic scenario, um, we, we looked at the highest prevalence of mass public shootings over that period of time, while the, the status quo just looked at the average uh, mass public shooting rates in terms of incidence and severity, while our optimistic scenario assumed a relatively low incidence and severity of mass public shootings. And, and in order to, to generate um, uh, these, these estimates, uh, uh, we relied on U.S. population projections to calculate the future number of mass public shootings for each scenario. And then in addition to the, the scenarios that, that we uh, considered, there, there were several other parameters uh, for our forecast. Uh, for example, um, we, we looked at several different types of, of distributions. Um, uh, Pareto, Weibull, and Log Normal to help us uh, generate those forecasts. Um, we looked at three different forecast horizons, uh, meaning we, we looked at the probability of uh, severe mass public shootings over the next five years, the next 10 years, and the next 20 years. And then uh, specifically, we, we looked at several different severity outcomes. Um, for example, we, we looked at 
at the probability of something as catastrophic as Orlando involving 49 fatal victims, as well as a mass public shooting as severe as Las Vegas involving uh, 60 uh, fatal victims. But then we also consider the probability of, of uh, mass public shootings that were even more severe than those. Um, and then finally, looking at number, total number of victims shot, um, 100, uh, which would be similar to what we observed for Orlando, 250, 500, which is similar to what we observed for Las Vegas, and then a mass public shooting with uh, 1,000 total victims shot. So the results that, that we saw uh, varied quite a bit across the, the different parameters that we used, and we don't have time. Uh, to go through all the forecasts, but instead I'd just like to focus on the results for the forecast where we used a, a 10-year horizon for, for the number of victims killed. Um, and also to provide you with a sense of the variation across scenarios, I'll focus just on the optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. And what these results indicate is that even, even though we do see, you know, some variation across the, the types of distributions that we use, our results suggest that, that there's at least a 38% probability that, that the United States will witness an attack as lethal as Orlando um, over the next 10 years. And this is under the most optimistic conditions. The, the probability for something as severe as Las Vegas uh, would be at least 26%. Um, for a mass public shooting with at least 75 victims, it would be 16%, and then it would be 9% uh, for a mass public shooting with at least 100 fatal victims. And then when we look at those probabilities under pessimistic conditions, meaning if we, if we assume that, that mass public shootings, that, that the incidents will be relatively high, we, we see that that probability increases to 51%. Uh, for something as serious as Orlando, uh, 37%. For something as serious as Las Vegas, 24%. For one involving 75 fatal victims, and then uh, 13% for a mass public shooting with at least 100 uh, fatal victims. And then this slide just provides an example. Um, of, of the results that, that we obtained uh, for a log normal distribution across three forecast horizons. Um, given time constraints, I won't really go through those too much, but instead I'll, I'll go ahead and jump ahead to our results for total number of victims shot in mass public shootings. And, and here we see that, that the probabilities, um, whether it's an optimistic or a pessimistic condition, is, is relatively high. Um, for, for an incident involving at least 100 victims shot. But, but when we go to, to 250 or higher, then, then the probabilities are relatively low. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that even with something like Las Vegas, where we saw almost 500 victims shot, that that was exceptionally rare, even with the, within the context of mass public shootings. And so just to, to wrap up here, um, so regardless of the forecast parameters we use, the odds are very low that, that we'll see a mass public shooting with as many total uh, gunfire victims as Las Vegas. But the odds are not trivial, though, uh, when we focus on, on fatalities. That we see even under the most optimistic conditions that, that it's at least 26% likelihood for a mass public shooting uh, with 60 victims killed. And that's over the next uh, 10 years, or close to 10% for a mass public shooting with 100 victims killed. And, and so this does have implications for resource allocation decisions uh, when it comes to law enforcement, medical professionals, policymakers. Um, it is worth pointing out, though, uh, there, there are some, some limitations to, uh, to our study. Uh, one is that it, it can't really tell us where or exactly when a severe mass public shooting may transpire. And, and we did see quite a bit of var variability across the parameters that we used, that the estimates uh, strongly depended on assumptions that, that we uh, made about the type of distribution and the tail location. Um, we, we did 
use a strategy that's relatively novel uh, for, for criminology, but we think it, it provides uh, valid estimates um, that enabled us to, to predict the probability of mass casualty events. And so at this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to my other co-panelist, Dr. Michael Roque. Thank you, Grant. Um, I appreciate everyone coming out here today and joining us for our talk on mass public shootings. Um, these two presentations have been pretty interesting, hopefully for you guys as well. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and, uh, and your questions at the end of the presentation. Today, what I'm going to be talking about represents two of the studies that we were funded to conduct um, by the National Institute of Justice. Uh, the first one is uh, an, an examination of state gun laws and whether they have any correlation with incidents and severity of mass public shootings. And then the second one is a, an examination of foiled or averted mass public shootings. So the first one has been recently published, and I'll give you the citation in, in just a minute. Uh, and the second one is very much in progress. So two different stages of, uh, of uh, progress here. Um, to talk about. The first study was motivated really by the idea that mass public shootings, as my co-panelists have mentioned, instill a lot of fear in the public. They get a lot of media attention. Um, and, and really, you, you all know, as soon as a, as a really severe mass public shooting happens, we instantly see commentary about what we can do about it, right? And they typically revolve around mental illness, or gun control. And both of those things are very controversial. And um, neither of them have a, a, a large amount of data to support um, policies. We also know that gun laws vary tremendously by state. And this slide is from The Guardian. It's just a, an illustration of how gun laws vary across states. Um, they, they vary tremendously. And there are, there are a lot of different gun laws. Uh, so the idea is, do gun laws have any relationship with mass public shootings. And to do this, we can look at across the United States over time and look at whether any changes in gun laws um, have any effects on mass public shootings um, and, and whether different laws have effects on the incidence of mass public shootings or also severity in terms of lethality and the number of victims. So this study really theoretically was motivated by Phil Cook's um, work, where he basically made the argument that that gun violence is driven by um, availability of guns. So in other words, more guns that are available um, lead to a higher incidence of, of gun violence. Uh, and this has been a controversial claim as well. You know, there has been uh, research that has shown the opposite. Um, but with respect to mass public shootings, it's also even more a little bit fine grain, right? Because um, these are very rare um, cases. Um, and there are, there are different ways that gun availability or gun control could influence um, mass public shootings. And, and here we just have two basic um, stories, two basic mechanisms. The first would be uh, from a routine activities perspective, you have a motivated offender, somebody who, who has it in their head that they would like to commit a mass public shooting, um, and then they need the tools to do so. So if they are in a place where they have um, access to uh, guns that could allow them to commit a mass public shooting, um, then that would al allow them to do so, and then the mass public shooting is more likely. An and another way of looking at this is that gun availability um, or the ease with which people can obtain guns could actually influence motivation. And, and motivation meaning um, the idea that someone has uh, in their head of what they want to do um, and whether what they want to do, say, shoot up a school, is even feasible given the restrictions on, on getting guns. So gun availability could actually influence motivation, which then could influence um, the incidence and lethality of mass public shootings. There has been in recent years, um, a few studies that have been looking at this, and, and again, it, it's not, you know, brain uh, surgery to make the connection that gun laws uh, might be related to mass public shootings um, and to, to look at this, but um, the studies that have done this are, are somewhat mixed um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what they've found. There, there are some previous studies who look at, basically, they try to classify gun 
law permissiveness, um, and they have found a relationship with mass public shootings. These three studies that are relatively recent have also looked at states, so the variation in terms of state and their gun laws and mass uh, public shootings, and they have all found that certain laws, for example, assault weapon bans, um, and then LCM stands for um, large capacity magazine bans, um, are, are related to the incidence and the severity of, of mass public shootings. Um, we look at, the, at these studies and, and they're well done, uh, except they rely on somewhat of an idiosyncratic definition of state laws. You know, what, what determines whether a, sta uh, a state has a, uh, a may issue law, for example, and, and what happens when that changes. Uh, and secondly, the mass shooting data has a, a few limitations in terms of, of the sources. Um, and so we, we tend to think that uh, our mass public shooting data set um, it, it overcomes some of these barriers. And, uh, and so that offers us um, a way to add to this conversation um, in a unique way. So the, the thing that, that is really interesting about this study is that we were able to partner with uh, Michael Siegel at uh, Boston University who has developed um, a very strong data set on gun laws across states. Uh, this is publicly available. The definitions are very clear. Um, you can take a look at it. And so what he did was he took um, those, uh, it was over 100 state laws uh, from 1991 to the present. And because our study goes all the way back to 1976, he took 89 of those state gun laws and uh, retroactively um, collected the data on the states. Um, for the purposes of this study, we focused on, focused on um, laws that would have a theoretical connection to mass public shootings. So those are the eight here, as you see, assault weapons bans, large capacity magazine bans, permits, extreme risk protection orders, universal background checks, may issue concealed carry laws, relinquishment of guns for those who are prohibited from owning a gun, and then violent misdemeanor prohibitions. Uh, again, the, the MPS, the Mass Public Shooting Data Set, um, utilizes a triangulated approach, which we have heard in, in both of the studies uh, so far, so I, won't, I will not belabor the point. But the, uh, the citation for the study, which was just recently published in Law and Human Behavior, is below. So to, to look at this, we use two different types of, of models. One is a logistic regression, so that's whether or not um, a, a state has um, a, a mass public shooting in a particular year, and then zero inflated negative binomial um, for incidents and number of fatalities and victims. Note, we did look at number of fatalities um, and the number of victims uh, separately. The findings are very, very similar. We also controlled for state clustering. We used robust standard errors, um, and we um, included uh, trends for for time. The controls here, what you what you can see is these are um, some demographic controls, um, and and also um, the controls for the logistic regression for incidents. The ones that I highlighted here in red were used in the number of uh, fatalities uh, models. And so just to really briefly, our results, um, the, what we're looking at, we have 155 mass public shootings that resulted in 1,078 deaths and 16, almost 1,700 non-fatal injuries. Now note, the 155 number is a little bit, is one lower than what Grant um, mentioned in his presentation because we are excluding uh, DC from, from this analysis. Uh, and here's just a map where you can see the average rate per million um, across the United States during this time period. And so you can see these are in quartiles. You can see places like Maine, uh, where I am, never did not have a mass public shooting um, over this time period. Um, so we're, we're quite proud of that. Um, but places you know, in the south and in the west, and Alaska actually has the highest um, incident. So the question is, what is the relationship between um, gun laws and mass public shootings? And uh, hopefully you can see this graph. This is just a plot of the odds ratios in the 95% confidence intervals. And an odds ratio above one that doesn't cross one uh, is statistically significant, meaning that um, there is a positive relationship. And then an odds ratio below one uh, is a negative relationship. So what you can see, these are just the significant um, variables, the, the ones that were non-significant are not included here. Um, but what you can see is um, that Permits um, requiring a permit to own a gun or a license 
uh, is negative. So that reduces the incidence of mass public shootings. And then the, the last row here, lo, uh, large capacity magazine bans, that's in red. So that's the, that's the severity model. So large capacity magazines. So in other words, um, we're banning um, magazines that can hold uh, a lot of uh, ammunition. That results in fewer deaths. And it also results in fewer um, non-fatal uh, victimizations per uh, per incident. Okay, so so the the models that we included um, modeled for um, whether there is a, an incident and then the number of victims uh, per incident. So that's the first study. The second one is one that is ongoing, and this is a a, a study that uh, has that draws on really. I got the we, we got the motivation from the work of Eric Madfis. Um, and Christine Sartici, among others. Uh, and I've been working with a couple of really fantastic students. Madison uh, Gerdes is a PhD student with um, Professor Fox, uh, and Madeline Clark Maddy was an undergraduate student um, with me at, at Bates. Uh, and over the last two summers, they have been helping me uh, collect data on averted mass public shootings. And, and the impetus for this study is that we know quite a bit about mass public shootings, even though we know less than what we might hope to know because of the varying definitions and the varying data sets, so on and so forth. But most of the research has been on, on mass public shootings that happened, right? So there's a little bit of a selection effect there. If we want to know what exactly um, is, uh, is provoking these mass public shootings and then what we, can we do to actually prevent them? One of the things that we have, have often found in mass public shooting literature is that there's often leakage. Leakage meaning the, the person or, or people who are the perpetrators have made their plans known, whether in writing or, um, or speaking with somebody. So there's, there's a warning there, and it seems like that would be a, a place where we could intervene. Um, and so the, this study is, is looking to compare mass public shootings that were completed with mass public shootings that were averted or thwarted or foiled. Um, do they look the same? Um, are there places in which we can intervene to save some lives? So at this point, there have been numerous studies that have looked at pre-attack behaviors or averted mass uh, public shootings. The, the pre-attack behaviors, this is an FBI study um, that tried to make sense of what happens before the mass shooting occurs. Or, or active shooting, as the FBI um, is, is oftentimes looking at, slightly different. But what they found was a vast majority of the people um, were, were spending more than a week in planning the attack, um, and they exhibited, we said, four to five concerning behaviors, and this could be something like mental illness or, or even leakage, right, or threats. So there are, there's, there's warning signs, um, and there is a, there's an opportunity to study averted mass public shootings. These are not spur of the moment. Uh, incidents, in other words. And then there have been a couple of papers that have looked at averted mass public shootings. Um, Laura Agnich has looked at uh, averted mass school shootings. Um, the uh, Daniels and colleagues have also looked at uh, mass uh, shootings in schools. Um, Eric Madfis has also focused on mass shootings in schools. The, this is where most of the research um, has been done. And again, finding that there there is a place where we can intervene, there's leakage. Uh, there is one study that just recently uh, came out by Jason Silva, and that looks at um, comparing completed to averted mass uh, public shootings. And that study found um, that there were some differences, right? So averted mass public shootings were more often younger, white. Um, they had more co-conspirators, uh, and there was less of a sort of a target-specific approach. In other words, they didn't have two or three people that they were really trying to attack. So our study is similar to that. There are a few differences, however. Um, ours looks uh, has a, a, a different data set, as, as we have uh, mentioned over the course of uh, these presentations. Um, we think it's it's a quite comprehensive. Um, we also use a different credibility assessment, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so one of the things that you really need to focus on and you really need to um, to understand is whether a threat is credible. In other words, when someone says, I want to shoot up my school, are they actually intending to do that or are they just kind of spouting off? So we, we want to be looking at credible threats. Um, and we also, uh, our, our averted mass shooting uh, data come from uh, a few different data sources as well. Um, but this is, this is just adding to the literature, or at least we hope it will anyway. 
So our definition, we had to start from a, uh, from a specific definition of averted mass public shooting, and that's actually a lot more difficult than you might think. How do you define something that never happened? And so basically we use the same definition for mass public shooting except um, that the, the shooting didn't take place. So we, we use the term plot, plan, or threat. Um, to shoot four more individuals. Now, this is a little bit difficult because um, if people say something like, uh, I'm going to bring a gun to school, does that mean that they were intending to shoot four more people? Um, so we had to be pretty specific in terms of how we um, how we collected that data. Uh, there had to be a very specific plan that was, that was clear that more, four or more people were intended um, as targets. Um, we also, in terms of our credibility assessment, so Silva required a gun or a plan to uh, acquire a gun, so, and that makes sense because, you know, the idea is that um, this is something that could actually happen. Ours is, a, is slightly different. We say that there has to be some sort of a detailed plan, right? So it's not just spouting off, but there's some planning going on, maybe maps or a list of targets or something like that, or weapons must be accessible. So it could be a less detailed plan if they had access to a weapon. So that's a slightly different um, approach here. So to collect data, starting not last summer, but 2019, we started with data sets. And we were really lucky um, that um, these scholars, Mad uh, Eric Madfis and Laura Agnich and Christine Sakichi, were willing to share their data sets. Um, and, and Madfis and Agnes, again, were focusing on schools. Christine Sarchisi is actually focusing, her paper, um, which is published um, a couple of years ago, looks at um, mass violence in general. Um, so we looked at those cases and we reviewed all of them to see whether they fit our um, definition. We also used the, the Averted School Violence uh, website. Um, there's a K-12 school shooting database. There's some online lists um, that are uh, available. And we just did uh, searches of the media. This is an open source uh, data collection strategy where we're, we're mostly using media sources. Um, there are some times when we had access to criminal justice records um, when we could fill in some of the blanks. Uh, each of the case was reviewed by at least myself and uh, one of the students. Um, mostly we focused on whether a case was credible or not, um, and, and then uh, we came to an agreement uh, if there was any. Usually we, we were on the same page. Um, so we developed a code book um, and started collecting data in 2019. Um, three of us uh, right now have been involved in, in collecting the data, um, and we were, we were very active uh, in terms of uh, trying to, to tweak the code book when it, when it didn't seem to fit um, some of the cases. Uh, and also to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of, of definitions. Uh, so one of the things that was um, was curious to me was whether we were defining different uh, categories and, and different variables um, the same. So uh, we decided that we were going to do a reliability assessment uh, this summer. We did a trial. Um, we found out that the trial was uh, was not really getting at what we were um, interested in, um, and then we we conducted a, a case, a 10 case reliability assessment. So 10 cases from the data set, the same sources for each of us, um, and then we coded what we call subjective fields, fields that are not uh, objective like age or, or, um, or uh, gender. Um, so these, this includes things like mental illness, the length of the plan, um, the response, motivation, and credibility. Uh, and then a, a quick percent agreement, it looked like there was overall pretty good agreement, but there was some variation. Uh, specifically, we have uh, we ran some uh, analyses here with uh, with Gwet's um, agreement coefficient, which is uh, recommended for reliability. And for the most part, we're, we're okay. Threat plan and threat length and the plan length were were a little bit difficult. So, how long had the people been planning this? We initially had it in coded in the number of days, but that was difficult information to to really discern from um, from the sources. So we, we broke it up into categories um, and and we have a pretty good handle on it now. But but the plan the length of the plan we know is uh, is a little bit um, uh, sketchy in terms of um, the reliability of the information. So just some challenges. Again, there's lots of, uh, of hidden information. Um, we know that there's there's probably a lot more cases that um, we just haven't uh, been aware of. These cases have to be, uh, generally speaking, they have to come to the attention of the media, and there are probably cases that um, that did not. There are also cases where people had plans and didn't maybe leak. These are often these are cases that 
uh, leakage occurred. Um, and uh, and so we had to we had to figure out a plan for identifying cases, but then also um, when we were having challenges with data collection, we have to figure out when to move on, when when we have all we can get. Um, we also the the big thing that we focused on was credibility. So we wanted to make sure that we all were on the same page with whether a case was credible or not. And as I said, two coders reviewed every case. And I just wanted to really briefly mention here uh, WhatsApp. Uh, we, we created a group chat where we were able to stay in touch pretty consistently um, and meet on a on a daily basis and, and discuss cases and discuss plans. Um, and it was it was really really helpful. Rather than having to be on Zoom all day long or have a phone call, um, which sometimes cannot be can be a little bit less. Um, uh, efficient WhatsApp was was I really recommend that for people working in group projects. Um, so what we have as of uh, as of this month, we have 210 cases in the averted. Um, the date range does not go back to 1976. The earliest one that we have is from 1999. It's generally um, incident um, structured. Uh, there are some quantitative and qualitative um, variables, and this is this is very very preliminary, but a quick comparison with between averted and completed. Um, so what Madison was able to do was code the completed data set, some of the variables in the similar way that we, we had coded the averted. And so what we see here is the age, right? Perhaps not um, unexpected, and this is in line with what Silva found, the average age is lower for, for averted. Now again, our data sources focus primarily on uh, school shooting, so that's not to be, um, that's not too surprising. What is kind of interesting is that the percent male for averted is, is lower, um, and then the percent white is higher. Uh, and then for mental illness, we see not, not too much of a difference, a little over 61% for um, completed and 40% for averted. Now, this is a very expansive definition of mental illness. This is whether some sort of mental health issue was mentioned at all in the case, not a formal diagnosis, okay? So just to wrap things up, because I know that we're running out of time, um, for the state laws paper, we see that ha a permit and uh, a large capacity magazine ban, these are related to the incident and then the severity of mass public shootings. This is across states, and this is in line with recent research. Um, we are not quite clear on the mechanism. We did have a, a measure in that study of household gun ownership rates, and that was not related to mass public shooting incidents, uh, interestingly enough. So we're, we're curious about people's thoughts on that. The averted mass public shooting project is continuing on. There, we found some similarities and some differences across completed versus averted. Um, and we will have in the future a more specific plan to compare. Although I do say, I do want to say that I'm a little hesitant to do formal statistical, statistical comparisons of completed and averted because they are not by any means uh, random uh, events. So I'll end that here and, and I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. We will go ahead and we'll and go back to uh, Barbara. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Again, uh, uh, to our panel, thank you very much uh, for uh, for this uh, for this presentation. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions uh, to. Uh, to, for you to answer. The first one is, what are the implications the findings have for the criminal justice system and on prevention? Uh, James, would you like to start? Well, I think each of us in our areas that we've covered can say something. I'm gonna focus again on the media since that's really what my presentation uh, concerned. Uh, there's a lot of media bashing and blaming in terms of uh, creating uh, uh, the surge and epidemic, and I think as misplaced. Uh, again, it's, you know, why should mass shooters be different than other murderers? I mean, we, uh, the newspapers, they can, they, can, they can name people who kill one, two, or three, but if they kill four, they can't name them. Or how about serial killers? We do biopics about them and true crime books. And what about mob killers? So I think it's impractical to treat mass shooters any different. And as I said, I don't think we should. Uh, it's, a, it's part of the story, it's part of the news. But again, there's a, there's a line that they sometimes cross. Uh, that, uh, and, I, and part of it's because we wanna know why. But we don't always know why. And, and in a case like Las Vegas, we don't know why. But in the process of, of collecting all this information, more than is needed, 
more than is relevant, we do a disservice. We do a disservice to the victims, their families, uh, and a dis disservice by making the person larger than life. So I think, I think let's, let's stop blaming the media uh, for creating an epidemic. One, there is not an epidemic, as I said, uh, but I, again, there's, there's a certain degree of control uh, uh, that the media should, should take on themselves. So in terms of the no notoriety pledge, well-meaning, and, and I think if the, if the idea is let's limit the amount of attention to what's necessary, that's fine, and I agree with that. But in terms of the total blackout of information, like uh, it's become very um, commonplace now when you have uh, uh, police chiefs saying, we're not going to mention the person's name, that's just not practical. Besides, the name's going to come out in the, in the uh, in social media anyway. I'll pass it to my colleagues for their comments about other things. So, so I think the the implication. I think there are probably several implications from the forecasting severity study that we did. Um, I think I think one is is that we we do see uh, that our estimates are influenced by the incidence of mass public shootings. So I, I do think that, that whatever policies and practices that, that we can implement to reduce the incidence of mass public shootings, that it will in turn um, likely reduce uh, the probability of, it, of a catastrophic mass public shooting taking place in the future. But I also think that even though, even though our forecasts don't specify exactly when or where a mass public shooting will take place or by whom, um, I do think it, it, it behooves us to, to try to plan uh, to the extent that we can for events that, <clears throat> that, our, that our study suggests is it's not, it's not a trivial probability that, that there, uh, something as serious as Las Vegas could take place in the U.S. at some point over the next five to ten years. And so uh, communities that, that, you know, whether it's the regional hospital systems or <clears throat> the law enforcement in terms of planning for large events uh, in, that, that take place in the public, that, um, that it, will, it will be important to, to try to, to plan for those in terms of having resources available. And, and I will say, with respect to the state gun laws, uh, the, the policy implications of that study would seem to be pretty clear in terms of permits reducing the incidence of mass public shootings. And then large capacity magazines appear to be um, related to the, the severity of mass public shootings. And so that is, that's a consistent finding that, that, all th that at least two other studies have, have found. And so I think it's something that we need to take seriously. Um, as, a, as a potential way to um, reduce the, the lethality. And, and as we've seen with the other presentations, the lethality and severity of mass public shootings has increased over time. And so that's something that um, we, can, we can perhaps um, take a look at. With respect to averted, I, that one is, I think, a very interesting project from a policy perspective, because really the idea is if we can study those who are um, – who, who have a plan to complete a mass public shooting then, and then don't? Maybe we can we can gain some insight on how these things can be can be uh, thwarted in the future. On the other hand, it almost it, that that entire data set is 210 incidents that no one got hurt, and so that shows you know what policies are, are working. And so schools are are, are re and, and states are, uh, across the country are, are really pushing for us to take seriously whenever anybody says that they are thinking about harming themselves or others. That seems to clearly work. Um, whether we can look at the, the completed versus um, averted and, and figure out other types of policies, I think maybe if we look at the differences between completed and averted, um, then we can see, we can see which um, incidents and, and which characteristics of the offender are more likely to actually uh, succeed. Uh, and so the Silva study, for example, finds that um, completed um, offenders are more likely to have a, a criminal record. So that's a, a place where we can maybe devote some resources um, on focusing on people who have a criminal record um, and trying to reduce their the, the chances that they might actually um, commit violence. Um, but but there's we're, we're very early in the stages of this study, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the results show. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Jim, but one, one cautionary point here, though, is, you know, we start looking at the background of, of uh, perpetrators, uh, whether it be uh, uh, the weapon of possession or domestic violence or any of the characteristics that Michael's talking about. This is a very rare event. And it, trying to predict and identify the next mass shooter is virtually impossible. There's, it's a, a huge haystack of uh, it's sort of needles in haystack, a huge haystack of people who have lots of characteristics that are commonplace among mass shooters, but very, very few needles who actually will turn their anger and angst into action. And we have to be very careful about, uh, about uh, false pauses, because if we start trying to predict who people are based on the common characteristics. And, and by the way, I know that tomorrow there'll be a presentation about the common characteristics, and it's something we're working on too. Uh, that's interesting to know what characters are common, but if, if you think you can use that to identify and predict, you'll be sorely mistaken. And it's frustrating. Of course, it's a, it's a base rate problem, very few cases compared to the number of people who might fit a profile. Thank you very, thank you very much uh, for these answers. Uh, one more very quick question before we give it to the audience. Based on your research this fall, Ed, um, what do you see as the future direction for the research field? Well, um, I think I'll take that. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about mass killings and mass killers. Uh, one, I know there's a question here about domestic violence as a precursor. Uh, I think what we need to do in the next few years is be real careful about trying to identify and correct a lot of the misconceptions and myths that are out there. In term, this is a this is a research area that's growing, as I showed the the, the trends in terms of scholarship. Uh, when in the infancy of this literature, there's a danger for a lot of of half baked ideas to get into the public uh, airwaves uh, and be misunderstood and misinterpreted. Uh, so I think that's very critical that we we uh, and, and one other thing I think we need to. Come, come to some agreement about what a mass shooting is. Because as I indicated, this confusion about mass shootings and people, people hear about one mass shooting a day based on the gun violence archive, and they think about El Paso, and they think about Dayton and Las Vegas, and that these things are happening every day. They're not. So the future direction is trying to get clarity, consensus, and correct a lot of the misconceptions that exist. So I, I would have to say I'm probably a little less hopeful than Jamie is about reaching consensus on a definition, but I do think um, part of, of Mike's uh, presentation focusing on averted cases, I think because that that is a newer line of research where there hasn't been as much done, that's that's not to, to denigrate the work that has been done. I think there's been some good research that, that's been done, but I I, if I, I see that as an area where, where we can make uh, significant inroads to uh, prevention um, in just because I, I, I think there's um, I think there's more for us to, to learn there. I, I think there's a lot more headway that, that we can make in terms of research for the averted cases. Michael, would you like to add anything? Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I agree with uh, what Grant just just said there. Uh, and I, but I do think that uh, piggybacking off of of Jamie, I think that description is really important. One of the the sub studies of our project is to simply describe these cases. Right. What do they look like? What are some trends over time? Um, as, as Jamie mentioned, is this an epidemic? Are they increasing? It seems to me that when when different data sources are agreeing on particular patterns or trends, um, then we can sort of be more confident that it is a trend and we can do something about it. Um, you know, when we when I first started being interested in, in mass shootings, there was so few 
what I would call empirical um, studies that that you couldn't really make sense of anything. And now that that the I could, if you Google Scholar mass public shootings or mass shootings, you'll see you know dozens and dozens of studies. And so we're starting to build a knowledge base um, on which we can we can perhaps um, try to figure out what types of policies uh, and approaches uh, could be effective. But uh, I think we're still building that literature, um, even though there there are some things that we feel pretty confident um, that that we know about mass public shootings. For example, it's very clear that it's that it's a male phenomenon, right? Um, but whether it's guns or not, there, there's going to be controversy um, w regardless of what side you're on. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. Um, uh, I will ask Daniel Clemens now to join us uh, uh, to uh, read some of the questions that are in our uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, just, to, just to let you know, although our webinar is scheduled to end in three minutes, we will stay online uh, uh, for, uh, for a little bit and for those who can still um, uh, participate, uh, please stay online. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we will, um, uh, 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 we will uh, provide the answers uh, to your questions as best as we can uh, when we post the webinar information, um, uh, the recording. So, Danielle, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. I'm going to try to alternate between the three participants, and this first question is for Jamie. What level, of, what level or percentage of first-person video games were consistent in the lives of the actors, shooters you have researched? Hmm. Uh, there's, an, there's always an a attempt to look for easy explanations and uh, easy answers. And one of those is this idea that, that mass killers, mass shooters, uh, are absorbed by, by video games and video games turn them into killers. Uh, it's actually perhaps the reverse, that certain individuals are fascinated, obsessed with violence. And it, so their fascination with violence, which is reflected in constant video game play, uh, is also reflected in their behavior. So people will point to, say, uh, the shooter at Sandy Hook, that he had a, a, a tremendous, uh, uh, spent a tremendous amount of hours playing violent video games. By the way, he also spent a tremendous amount of hours playing non-violent video games, like Dance, 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 Steve, I think it was called. Uh, but if, if playing violent video games were really a predictor uh, and a cause of mass shooters, boy, we'd have far more cases than we do now. Because millions and millions of Americans play endless hours of violent video games, and they don't even consider committing murder. So uh, I think that's a red herring. Now, in terms of the percentage, we have not collected those data. And I know tomorrow, uh, I think the Violence Project has, but the point is it's very hard data to find, a lot of missing information, and I, I think it's a, a dead end, frankly, and no, no pun intended. Uh, it's not really a factor in understanding why be people become mass killers. There's other reasons, but that's certainly not one. That's a reflection of the, be the behavior, not a cause of it. Thank you. Thank you. The mm -hmm. next question is for Grant. Um, very interesting, all those scary forecasts of future mass shootings. In your opinion, which conditions, um, example, firearm legislation, location, et cetera, have the most influence on these forecasts? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, um, some of um, some of the results that that Mike presented uh, suggest that that there could potentially be uh, some firearm legislation specific to, to mass public shootings that might have an impact on on the incidents. Um, we also see that that location matters too in terms of. And, and, and I think it's important to, to specify that location means like, um, like the, the population density uh, of, of the location, meaning that, that we do see um, more mass public shootings uh, on a per capita basis for, for you know, those places that, that have larger population sizes. And that's consistent with the map that, that, that Mike presented too. 
Um, and so I do think that that both tend to have an impact, um, in, or at least they, they could influence the impact of, of the forecasts that, that I presented in, in those slides. Um, just because we do see that that the the incidence matters in terms of like how common uh, we're assuming mass public shootings to be. Uh, but I will say that that all of the assumptions that we use are consistent. Like a year moving average over that three year period. Like, what was the lowest five year period? And that was what we assumed for the optimistic forecast. Whereas for the pessimistic forecast, we, we looked at, say, you know, a five or 10 or 20 year moving average of the highest prevalence. And so when we make those different assumptions about the incidents, it does have an impact on what those forecasts show. Great, thank you. This next question is for Michael. What are your thoughts about red flag laws? Are you aware of any studies detailing petitions submitted to the courts prohibiting others from obtaining firearms on the basis of gender, race, nat national origin, religious affiliation, et cetera? Uh, I am not aware of any research. Uh, like I said in the in the talk, the the really sophisticated research that has examined state laws and, and mass shootings uh, is, is only about five or, or a little bit more than that years old. Um, but I have heard about the, you know, the, the idea that red flag laws might be something that, um, that could be potentially um, useful, um, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any, any research that has looked at it in a rigorous fashion. And the other co-panelists can jump in if they, if they agree or disagree. There's research on, on suicide and um, and red flag laws. It's kind of interesting because when you look at the motivation, why red flag laws have been enacted, it's always following a mass killing or a, or a high profile uh, murder. In Indiana and Connecticut, which were the first to establish uh, red flag laws, they, they were associated with murders. And of course, since Parkland shooting, uh, we've seen a lot of talk about red flag laws. But there hasn't been any research on red flag laws and multiple homicide. I'm hoping there will be, and uh, clearly given the proliferation of laws in the last past couple of years, there's, a, there's a, a wonderful opportunity. I've tried to get some of my doctoral students to take that on as a dissertation, as a, as a quasi-experiment. But nothing yet. Hopefully we will see something. All right, thanks. Moving to the next question. Um, this one's for Jamie. Um, according to several sources, more than 100 people are killed with guns and 200 more are shot and wounded on a daily basis in the U.S. Do you believe that there should be more news coverage dealing with violence related to guns? Yes, uh, there should. And, and what's, what's unfortunate is that mass killings that represent far less than 1% of gun homicides receive the overwhelming majority of attention in the press. Those are the hardest cases to deal with because they are so rare. Uh, and many of the pr proposals that we have for dealing with mass killings may or may not work. You know, it's even, when you have something that happens about four, five, six times a year, it's even hard to determine whether there's an impact given the low level of frequency. But a lot of the procedures, in fact, that have been proposed uh, whether it be red flag laws or change in the age related to purchases of, uh, of, of, of weapons or limits on, on magazine size, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These may be good ideas, but in terms of mass killers, these are very determined individuals, very difficult in people to stop. They are, they are willing to, to die to get even with whatever enemy that they see in their lives. Uh, and oftentimes they will get a gun or get the weapon that they need, regardless of what Roblox can put in their path. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. We should. In fact, a lot of the procedure proposals for gun legislation uh, would likely have an effect on the on the majority of of homicides we see every day in America. You know, the weekend of uh, El Paso and 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 uh, in Dayton, there were uh, 33 people were killed that weekend in two mass killings. That's the average number of people killed in gun homicides every day in America. That's what the focus should be, really, in terms of prevention. 
those are the cases that we perhaps can make the greatest inroads. So the irony is the uh, mass killings are often fuel and motivation for doing something about guns, yet the least likely to be impacted by those same procedures. The ones that could be impacted are the homicides we see every day. Thank you. The next question is for Grant. Can you explain how these forecasts influence resource allocation in practice? If we cannot say when or where these mass public shootings may occur with any specificity, how can one prevent or mitigate these incidents? Yeah, so I, I, I think I, try, I sort of tried to address the question to, to some extent earlier. Um, I think I think the what the results from our forecasting study indicate probably have more implications for how we respond and potentially um, mitigate the severity of these incidents as opposed to prevention. And 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 what I what I mean by that is is um, you know like uh, modeling trauma capacity for 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 regional healthcare systems. You know in the response to to a mass casualty event, um, you know, our results suggest that uh, that something on the order of a mass public shooting involving more than 50 fatal victims or more than 100 victims shot that that's something that some community within our country will likely have to deal with at some point over the next five to 10 years. Um, so I think building up or at least having that capacity in planning for it um, would be important. And I think a, a, I think the uh, a similar principle applies to uh, law enforcement when it comes to um, you know planning for large public events. Um, that our, our findings suggest that you know those potentially could be ven venues where uh, where we could see a large scale attack take place. Thank you. Um, the next question, I believe, is for Michael. It came in during your presentation, but if it is not directed towards you, um, or the other panelists can feel free to jump in. Can you please define felony versus family versus public? Yeah, I'm not sure that was uh, related to to my talk, but um, the the felony versus family versus public is in terms of how we define our universe of, of cases here. We're focusing on mass public shootings. Uh, and that was defined as uh, any event with um, four or more uh, vict uh, gun deaths, um, not including the perpetrator in a public place. And, and we specifically said not related to another type of crime. And so a, a felony related mass public shooting would be something like if somebody walked into a McDonald's and tried attempted um, to rob the place and then four more people were shot. That would be a felony related. And then a family, uh, Jamie calls them family annihilations. These are these are cases where, uh, and these are much more prevalent, where um, generally speaking a man um, is having some sort of an issue and then he kills his wife and children. Uh, and so that's a mass shooting, but it's not a public shooting. Uh, and it's a, it's a familicide, which is typically thought as much different in terms of motivation than a mass public shooting. Um, and also, as Jamie mentioned, something that uh, those are events that do not t tend to capture our collective attention as much because they seem like a problem for other people and not us. Thank you. Um, the next question is not directed at anyone specifically. Um, so regarding the uptick in um, mass public shootings the past few years, is there a link between this increase in the use of higher capacity magazines and weapons and the choice of where a shooter chooses to commit the crime or both? Well, I, I think um, that was partially answered by, by Michael's presentation already. In terms of location though, I mean the, rise in the number of hate motivated mass killings uh, certainly has Im impacted location such as uh, church shootings or uh, shooting in, at the synagogue in in, uh, in Pittsburgh can i say okay. i there's a question there about domestic violence that i think i really want to answer can any chance i can do that 
yes, please. Someone asked about the role of domestic violence as a precursor uh, and what percentage of mass killers have that have domestic violence in their background, and can we use that as a predictor? Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding there. Uh, a few years ago, the, the uh, Every Town for Gun Safety did a report on, on mass shootings, and they indicated in the report that 54% of, of mass, mass shootings involved, and four more people killed, involved domestic violence. All the news stories in the wake of that uh, claimed that 54% of mass killers had domestic violence in their background. That's not what every town for gun safety reported. The 54% were either family massacres or occasionally a non-family massacre where there was domestic violence in the background. I mean, the 54% of domestic violence was the mass killing not prior mass killings. If you look at prior events um, in terms of mass killer, killings, we're only talking about around, depends on how you define domestic violence. If you're looking at official reports of domestic violence or just rumors, 25%, give or take, have domestic violence in the background. And most of those are family massacres where there was prior domestic violence. If you're talking about public mass shootings, less than 10% have domestic violence in the background of the shooter. In fact, many of these guys live alone. They don't have family around. They're not, they're not married uh, and, and don't have kids. So in terms of mass public shootings, it is relatively rare that domestic violence is a precursor. Now, is domestic violence an issue for, for society? Absolutely. But, and, and unfortunately, there are millions and millions of cases of domestic violence every year. But as a predictor of, of mass murder, not so much. All right. Um, we're now almost 15 minutes over. Just checking that we're going to still continue on with the question and answers. I can stay till four. Um, maybe just one, one more question to each panelist, and we will wrap it up. Okay, I'm gonna look at the questions that are just coming in and they're not directed towards anyone, so just feel free to jump in. Um, any advice for how law enforcement can play a more vi viable role in the interruption in these events? Someone wanna take that? I've been speaking a lot. Well, I, I will, I'll jump in here and I will say, with respect to averted mass uh, public shootings, uh, a lot of the, the research has been done in schools, and so the, the, the school security officers or SROs have a huge role to play um, in creating a, a culture in which students know that they shouldn't be silent, right? Eric Madfis, his work uh, teams, seems, tends to show that there, there's this sort of expectation that uh, if you're friends with someone who is maybe – um, making comments that, that appear like they could be heading down that path, you, you want to protect them by not saying anything, right? This, this uh, code of silence, and that's, that's troublesome. And so the, the school resource officer um, can be instrumental in terms of the, the culture that is uh, created, but also they're there. They're, they're someone who can, um, can intervene and, and also teach the students um, warning signs and, and uh, things to look out for. So um, from that perspective, I would say that law enforcement can be really um, instrumental in, in reducing these incidents. Jamie, I, I didn't want to cut you off. I'm oh, sorry. You didn't. You didn't. Feel free, Jamie. Go ahead. I didn't, no one cut me off. It's okay. Danielle, do you have another question? Oh. Yep, sure. Here we go. Here's one for the group. Um, I know this is related just for guns, but what happens if the suspect uses a knife and killed four or five? Do you consider this a mass killing? It is a mass killing. Uh, in fact, um, I mentioned that the, if I can give a plug here, the, the Associated Press, USA Today, Northeastern University mass killing database, we have a database of every mass killing form of people killed. Now, uh, about 19% of mass killings involve weapons other than a gun. 
And what's interesting is, and I've looked at the, the amount of media attention that mass killings without a gun get compared to mass killings with a gun, and it, it's exorbitant difference. And that's probably because the whole issue of gun control is not debated in the wake of a, of a mass killing when someone is, uses a knife. There's no discussion about knife control. So it's amazing how much different attention there is between those two crimes. But when you consider the fact that people are still dead, it doesn't matter if they're stabbed or shot, they're still dead. And it still matters. Uh, and, I, and I also say something about the other kinds of, of – uh, uh, Michael mentioned how family massacres get very little attention. And that's true. Family massacres are hardly reported in the press, local press, but not the national press. And let's also keep in mind that it doesn't matter if the perpetrator, someone who kills you was a stranger or a family member, you're still dead. So I think that we should, we should be as concerned about family massacres as we are about public massacres. And we should be concerned as much about uh, knife killings and bombings and, and, and deaths from arson as we, sh as we do with shootings. It's just that shootings get a lot of attention because of, of, of the debate about the Second Amendment. So thank you very much, Danielle. And um, uh, with this, we will start wrapping up. Uh, I want to again thank our panelists. Thank you, James. Thank you, Grant. And thank you, Michael, for uh, uh, for presenting and having this conversation with, with us. Um, we're looking forward uh, to um, uh, to other findings uh, that your uh, project will uh, eventually produce. Um, we anticipate that they will come within a year or so. Uh, for those of you who w are willing to uh, attend tomorrow's webinar, it is the second part. We will have different uh, uh, research, uh, research teams uh, and a little bit different topics, but they will all pertain to my public shooting. With this, I want to thank you very much. And Mary Jo, uh, I'm going to give the floor to you. Thank you um, very much, everyone, for attending, um, and we appreciate your time. So on behalf of NIJ and all of our presenters, um, again, thank you for today. <laughs>